totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll out! We are totally booked. Welcome back to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Find the podcast at bookedonrock.com. Every episode there in both audio and video, exclusive video segments from each episode, links to all of the social media sites, and the latest rock book releases, all at bookedonrock.com. Our guest is Steve Moriarty, the drummer of the band The Gits, and author of the new book, Mia Zapata and The Gits, a story of art, rock, and revolution. The Gits, led by their charismatic frontwoman Mia Zapata, formed in Ohio before joining the burgeoning Seattle music scene of the early 90s. They were on the brink of international stardom when on July 7, 1993, just days before their third U.S. tour, Mia was brutally murdered. Her death came as a shock to the Seattle music scene and eventually became a national story. It would be a decade before her killer was arrested. During that time, the focus of Mia's story shifted further and further away from her talents and the music she created with the Gits. In this book, Steve Moriarty is determined to shift the focus from Mia's tragic end back to the Archie and the Gits created, recounting their journey from their first meeting at Antioch College in 1985 to the rise in the Seattle music scene. Steve narrates the band's struggles, their inspirations, and the camaraderie that fueled their music as well as the band's tours and performances alongside iconic acts like Nirvana and Joan Jett. A playlist of the gits can be found on the show notes page. Hey, Steve, welcome to the podcast. Nice to meet you. Hi, Eric. Nice to meet you. Congratulations on a book that took a long time. It started out about, it's been about 10 years, actually, but it was odd because um, uh, an illustrator in Seattle, outside of Seattle, contacted me. And he was a pretty well-known guy. He's done posters for everyone from you know Nirvana and Mud Honey and Smashing Pumpkins to uh, album art and zines. And he's published. He used to be the art director at Fantagraphics Comics too. And his name is Pat Moriarty. Well, my father's name was Pat Moriarty, and he died in like '98. So this guy, Pat Moriarty, wrote me on Facebook and goes, hey, this is Pat Moriarty, and I, want, I was going to do a graphic novel about the band Mud Honey, but I think your band is much more interesting, and I, I would like to do a graphic novel about the Gits. And I was like, well, I don't know if I can if I can um, give permission for that, but sure, what, what do you want to do? He goes, well, if you write the story, I'll is, illustrate it. So I started writing some stories, some little stories of stuff that happened on tour, and, um, and after a while... Uh, I mean, I love the idea to have like written by Steve Moriarty, illustrated by Pat Moriarty. I just thought it'd be like people would think we're married or something. Yeah. And anyway, um, it, uh, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't write in little chunks like that. And it turned out like the story was way too much. And even picking out like five years of my life to write a memoir about, which is basically what it is, or six years, um, I, I couldn't condense it down into little stories and, and to draw, even though he did start drawing it. So I had to cut the cord <laughs> and break loose and, and just do a full on book. Well, and you found a great publisher, Feral House. I'm a big fan of. Oh, good. Yeah, I was too. They, I, they, I, found them I got a lot of rejection letters too. So they, 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 they take on it. some great stories and this is a great story. And it's a story that's worth telling because I, I get obviously the, the, the goal of this book is because really the, the shift of the attention over the the 10 years since Mia's passing was more about the true crime, the mystery, all this stuff. And it was like forgotten the the music yeah. that was made and the story, the great stories that that you tell in the book about getting to know her and all this. So I would think that when did the idea, when did that kind of enter your mind to say, you know what, this is important to write? Well, I knew, I think I was, um, I think what happened was I, um, you know, I was looking up, kind of going back and reminiscing and listening to the old records and, and thinking, gosh, how, you know, thinking about release, re-releasing the records because they were out of print. And uh, and it, it occurred to me when I went to Wikipedia that there was nothing written about the music or the or us as band members or as friends or uh, even as a band. It was all about the murder, right? Mia's murder. And uh, it just I just was disgusted at a certain point. I'm like, there's nothing I can find online that that doesn't start out with rape and murder in the first sentence or two. And uh, and I just wanted to reframe that narrative so that it, people would actually know what the band was about and the music, as opposed to like what the you know worst ten years of my life was like, searching for the killer and and finding him. 
he died of COVID, however, which is which was kind of a relief. So you can feel a little bit good about COVID limit eliminate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was just telling you, yeah, I, I I'm recovering from it and so are you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was in prison when he passed, I believe, right? Yeah, he was well, he was well seated. Well 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 seated in prison there and somewhere in eastern Washington. I, I don't care where, but I got I was yep. a witness. So I was on a witness quote witness protection project. So I, they had to uh, notify me if he ever gets moved or released or paroled or or dies. And I got a letter from some institutional letters saying that he had died. Mm -hmm. um, but that I wanted to write something that didn't focus on that. And I didn't even want to include a, a single word about her death. And that's why the book ends a day before she dies and everything is looking really great for the band and for us as people. Yeah. And we'll get to that point of the book. Let's start in the beginning when, when you first meet her, you first meet Mia while attending Ohio's Antioch College, 1985, yeah. right? What was your first impression of her when you when you saw her perform and, and as a person? I just thought she was, you know, she was an older student. She was like one or two years ahead of me. And uh, um, she she was one of the first people that reached out and just said hello. And I remember, I think I put it in the book that we were at a, at a bar and she invited me over to her table and I hadn't met her and she was with a girlfriend and they were both super cute and I was all nervous and sweaty and like, oh, these girls. And um, didn't really knew I didn't have a chance. But um, after a few drinks, um, I had mentioned that I was a drummer. They were, she was an artist. Uh, she did painting. And um, I, she didn't really play music except for, you know, with an acoustic guitar around a campfire kind of thing. Um, and... Uh, so I said, yeah, well, I'm not really an artist. I'm just a drummer. And she goes, what are you talking about? You're an artist. A drummer is an artist. And it just had never occurred to me. And that was like my first impression of her was validating what I had done my whole life and, and loved doing and had never really considered an artistic endeavor. And that uh, it just made me feel good. And so she was like that. She would point out things that that made made people feel good about themselves, you know, insightful things. She was a very insightful, empathic person. She could tell if you were going through something or not. She could read read your expression, people's expressions very well. Yeah, it seemed to translate on stage too. First time you saw her perform was around 85, was it? Shit, I don't know. On the I same think... bill, was, was it, if I recall? Uh, I think the first time I saw, I mean, I saw her perform from the back, right? Because I was always drumming with her. Um, I think she she would do a couple of uh, acoustic, um, little acoustic shows where she would do her songs acoustically. And maybe... I don't think I ever saw her before we before I joined the band, but they um they definitely the couple of times that I saw her play solo with acoustic guitar and singing, I was just you know I was blown away by her voice and like her engagement with the audience, especially because she'd be super nervous, but she would pretty much she would playing a show there might be a hundred people out there, but every single person there would think that she was singing to them personally because <laughs> her lyrics were were very universal, but she would just had a way of connecting with everyone there, you know, and honoring their presence. And that, that was just, I've never seen anyone do that before. You know, yeah. never, it, there, there are some performances on YouTube. So I was able to check those out. Oh, you can see yeah. It you can see it. Yeah. There's one great one. We we're playing a place on a St. Patrick's day show. We're dressed up in costumes and that one's pretty, uh, pretty telling of like the vibe. The place was completely packed and everyone was just waiting for us to play. And, um, St. Patrick's day, 1993, and it was, uh, you could just see, you can just see her connecting with the people out there. Yeah. Yeah. Just magnetic. Yeah. Great stories of those early days, just hanging out with her too. Like uh, <laughs> when you when you came over and she's painting and she's splashing the paint, you know, on the canvas and all this, just, it was like mm -hmm. somebody you wanted to be around and you never knew what to expect. Like the story, exactly. what did she take it to some, she took it to some yard, backyard, somebody's backyard where there's a, a, a cat that was buried. Uh, in my back, cat. Your buried cat. cat. <laughs> yeah. It, it was, it's but, but, but it was like, you know, just for you, was it, you just, you wanted to be around her cause you never knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. But I was also afraid of her, you know, cause she was, <laughs> she was so unpredictable, but I, yeah. I loved to be around her cause she was so fun. And, um, you know, it, it would always be an adventure. It would be an absolute adventure if you were with her. And if you hung out with her, you were the only person in the world. It wasn't like she's going to chat with somebody or talk to you while looking at someone else or or not not sort of be present with you. She was a very present friend to have. And she was and like that with all the guys in the band, you said, right? Each and every one of the guys <laughs> in the band. It... For the most part, at, at certain times, I'm not, I can't really say what her relationship was, was with the other two guys, but I know that they were, they, that we were all close and she was close to them. But, uh, you know, each one of us had our 
our squabbles at times, you know, over seven years or eight years that we knew each other and up longer. But um, I never, I never knew her to squabble with any of us. And she, but she had a different sort of friendship with each, each of us. She lived with Andy, the guitarist. Um, they, they lived together in two or three different places in Seattle and um, were great roommates. And uh, um, I never lived with, I guess I lived with her at the rat house, sort of our punk house that we had for a couple of years. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, um, we were just, we we're just friends, you know, she was like a sister really pretty much. You said she had an extroverted side and also an introverted side to her tremendous creative energy, but then there were her struggles yeah. with alcohol and the dyslexia. So were those the kind of things that would cause her to maybe be more isolated at times? I don't know. I think she was just a private person in many ways and very sensitive. And so she wouldn't subject herself to a lot of bullshit. You know, I think she was, she was, uh, she was kind and she was just careful. She was, she was careful about people's feelings, you know, and that didn't, that took the form of, uh, of not being a social butterfly, but being a, a good friend, you know. And what about her creative side? Speaking of that, her love of the blues is that that's really what influenced uh, her quite a bit. And she was did. able to channel that into her own style. I would say, yeah. I mean, if you listen to the Gits music, you, you'll hear a lot of blues influence. And she she came from the south, from Louisville, Kentucky, which is really the south, and uh, which is just an hour and a half south of where I grew up. So it was um, we kind of had that in common. Like Midwesterners, I think, are known for being friendly, and Southerners are known for their hospitality. So I think um, she sort of embodied both of those things, but was also like ready to get the hell out of there when she could, just like I was. Um, for the back, you know, sort of less than progressive thoughts and and you know, people and music scenes and stuff. But um, yeah, the question was about her creative side or, or the blues. Well, yeah, her, how that influenced her. And father were both were both in the in the um, entertainment industry. Her mother was one of the first and foremost uh, executives at Fox Television in the eighties. She was a, a According to her, to Mia's brother, Eric, she was the highest paid female executive at Fox for some time. And um, uh, I, th I think she was a producer or I don't know exactly what she did there. Her father was also in radio and television, um, although he disappeared from her life early on and came back later once we were hanging out. So once I knew her, she, he came back and was trying to become part of her life again. Um, but, I believe but the, she had that influence. The night that you, the story where you're knocking on the door and she's in there and painting and she, she was playing yeah. some pr pretty, pretty eclectic uh, uh, music on the turntable, right? All kinds of stuff. What was she, what did I say in the book? Um, was it uh, Lou Reed? Maybe was on the turntable. Yeah. yeah she loved stuff like a lot of New York stuff like Lou Reed. Yeah, and yeah, and, um, she loved Iggy pop and she loved, but she also loved hardcore bands like, the bad brains and poison idea and obscure stuff that she just would hear. Um, she didn't like pop very well, but she would, she'd be listening to like a Billy holiday record or Sarah Vaughn or someone like a uh, blues, like uh, Taj Mahal or even older, like Ma Rainey, like old 78s that she would find. And oh, the, yeah, the pretenders too. That was the other one. Pretenders. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, women singers, but she wasn't like a, a fanatic for women's music or women singing. She she just appreciated good rock, yeah, and good rock and roll and punk and whatever had what ha, whatever had soul. You know, she really dug it. And a really good painter. These are pictures in the book. This is one. Yeah, I think the, <laughs> yeah. You see it. That was that, that was a uh, about right. a life size painting. That was about eight by six feet. That one there. Yeah, eight by five, the painting of her relative. Yeah, the story yeah. of the the band name the Gits was much longer. It started out much longer than that. What's the origin of that name? <laughs> the original name, which carried on all the way to Seattle, probably three years of the band. Uh, the full name was The Sniveling Little Rat-Faced Gits. And that was lifted from a Monty Python episode from 1971 <laughs> or something, um, where um, it's, a cocktail, it's a vignette at a cocktail party, and um, one of the troop is introducing his family, and his wife is stupid, fat, ugly, boring git, and he has uh, insipid, stupid little git and his son. 
sniveling little rat face could get something like that. So he introduces himself, and that's the end of the story. And we just thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> We're fans of Monty Python because of its crazy, you know, its ridiculous sort of humor and slapstick and silliness. And um, so we wrote to them to ask if we could use the name, the Gits, and um, and we didn't think they would write back. But back then, you could write a letter to someone, and they might write back. You know, you could send it. You know? And um, so we sent a got an address from somewhere, maybe at the end of a a DVD or something. I guess that was one of VHS cassettes and wrote to the, to the troop or the production company. And someone wrote back saying, Oh yeah, no problem. Go ahead and use it. <laughs> Call yourself the gift. We don't care. So and um, you did write a song under the full, the full name. It's not yeah, one yeah, of the, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Our first demo, we had a song called the Stumbling on a Rat Face Git. And right. It was going to be the theme song, kind of like <laughs> the descendants had a theme song and like, um, you know, bands of that era would have theme songs, minor threat, you know, we're not a real, we're just a minor threat. You know, this is a great story about your move to Seattle. I say that because it's not like, I'm sure people would have thought, Oh, they must've moved to Seattle. Cause that's, you know, that's, that was like the hotbed of music at the time, but that wasn't the case. I mean, the year was 1989 and you decided yeah. to go to Seattle. It, it Seattle wasn't on anyone's radar yet. So what led to you moving there instead of LA or San Fran or New York or Chicago? We took, we took like a compass, you know, one of those compasses that you make <laughs> with the circles with, and tr- got tried to find the point to point distance the furthest furthest away from Ohio as we could get, and that was Seattle. Besides How crazy! Anything. How cra- and you were like right on the on the verge of, you know, of of this huge music about, scene. San Francisco seemed to be too expensive, and and they had lived there for a while. It seemed too crazy, and Seattle just seemed more manageable. I don't know why we ended up there, really, what we did. And it happened to be, I think the first show I went to see there, we had a place called the Moore Theater, holds about 2,000 people. And it was half full, or barely. And I think the bill was Soundgarden, Nirvana, and Tad. And I don't think it sold out. And um, it was a good show. I thought Tad was really good. The other two bands I I wasn't too into at that point. Well, Those early days in Seattle, if you could talk about those days, because they you guys felt like outsiders because most of the bands there had grown up in Seattle. So how, how much of a challenge was that and how long before you finally felt like you belonged? Yeah. If you just look at Tad Nirvana and, and Soundgarden, they are, they were all from the area. They were, they were all knew each other. They all rehearsed like in the same rehearsal area. So they kind of grew up, they kind of grew up together. Basically um, their parents lived there. Their parents were also musicians some, in some cases. And one was an entertainment lawyer. So they kind of had, they kind of had an in, you know, and had been in band since high school. So when we got there, we played it sort of a different, we looked a little different because we were more, we had more of a, like, I don't know, a punk look. We had, um, we dressed more punk rock. We weren't like Northwest. We didn't wear flannel, for example. <laughs> we were more in leather and, and combat boots and, 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 uh, spiky hair and stuff. And we weren't, we weren't, didn't have long hair and like they did. And we, we thought, I guess I'll speak for myself. I thought the bands, it sounded very derivative. I thought like they either sounded like Black Sabbath or Iggy and the Stooges. And if you have Mud Honey and there was that garage rock thing and they all kind of sounded like the Stooges to me or like a 70s garage or 60s garage rock band. And then you got into Soundgarden and even Nirvana and some of those bands that were like slow and drudgy and kind of melodic and sounded like Black Sabbath for the most part, tuned down to D oftentimes yeah um, that was the Tad influence was actually of of those bands the least known and probably the most talented and probably the guy that brought the quote grunge sound really to light in that area in seattle um Tad yeah was, uh, uh, steve turner was on this podcast because he put a great book out on, on the mud honey story who was that uh steve turner the guitarist from oh, steve yeah, yeah 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 he's a cool guy we i know steve for a long time okay i figured as much and yeah, yeah he, he, book. i'll have to check it out i'll trade him <laughs> it's a great book yeah garage rock was the thing that was his thing mm-hmm. you know that that was the talked about yeah the influence I got, yeah. I later you know i appreciated those bands more but when you come into a scene there's always that like everyone's about the same age everyone's trying to get the same gigs at the same two clubs that were had live music and uh and they were competition. So like they would, they would get signed or go on a tour or something. And that would make us want to achieve that or do better. So when Nirvana and Mud Honey and Tad got back from Europe, touring Europe right around the fall, when the Berlin wall fell, 
I was jealous. I was like, I, I want to be in Berlin during the fall of the Berlin Wall playing at a party for it. So I, I'm going to book a tour of Europe. So six months later, we got our asses to Europe and toured there. So it was always like a game of catch catch up or cat and mouse, just kind of like who's who's doing this, then we, we want to do that. Or if we did this, other bands would want to do that. And it kind of was a healthy competition in essence. Booked on Rock Podcast. We'll be back after this. Are you listening? Now don't go away, ladies and gentlemen. We'll soon be with you. Steve Moriarty. Drummer of the Gits, author of Me as a Pot and the Gits, the story of art, rock, and revolution. It comes yeah. out uh, tomorrow. Today's August 12th. We're recording this, so it's out tomorrow. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to honor at your local bookstore. Hopefully, people will order it from bookstores or record stores, and maybe they'll get a second copy in, in stores for people that way. Well worth the read. And yeah. with, with the success of Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Soundgarden, the Seattle bands, they're getting signed left and right, but the Gits didn't get signed a big part of that was you say simply because fronted by a female like the, the labels didn't think that was a viable thing is that is that no. was that no or what was the reason you felt there were very few bands with females in that in seattle um there were very few bands with females at all and it wasn't until like the riot girl scene and olympia and bikini kill and bratmobile and those bands began began to really become loud and out out front and playing gigs and talking about it a lot and and with the more feminist push around music that i think women started to feel more comfortable playing and stepping up and starting bands it allowed that and i think mia did that too is like people saw mia up there playing and she was so genuine and real and honest that they oh i can do that too if she can do it and you ever see a performer like a musician or um anyone doing anything in the arts and and it, and it looks so easy and it looks like they they just it just comes out of them and you're like they they make it seem like you can do it too and to me that's what punk rock was about it's like anyone can do it anyone with with something to say should and and can can form a band and and have something to say loud you know and do it in front of people that will listen so i think mia allowed other women to step up and front bands or start bands or play in bands so by the time we ended that band ended in 93 i think I think a significant shift had taken place. You guys um, must have been pissed because the music kicked ass and you should have been signed along with the other bands. Like, well, I believe we were time. signed. We were signed to a couple of independent record labels. Was Sub Pop one of the labels that? Uh, Fat Sub Mike from Fat Records, he wanted to sign us as his first band on his label, but we turned him down and signed to CZ Records, which had been like a guy that had worked at Sub Pop and started his own label and had pretty good track record. Um, I think we were negotiating with Atlantic Records, which would be considered a major, one of the three majors uh, or four. And and they, um, apparently we were signed. We were about to be signed if had we signed the contract because it was in the mail. We had just finished meetings with them on the day before she was murdered. And that's that was kind of in the works. We had talked to our lawyer who was negotiating a contract with Atlantic Records and we would have had a career sort of set up for the next, I don't know, 11 records or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been a it would have been a, a really great, interesting living. Yeah, you met with Tim Summer of Atlantic Tim Records, Summer. right? Oh, he had God. a meeting with you. Yeah, what was discussed in that meeting? And, and he uh, he wanted to sign us. He said, you know, what do you need? And we're like, well, we don't, we're going to get a lawyer to ask to find out. But he said, oh, you know, with with you know, you'll have money. You won't have to work. You'll be able to you know travel and do shows and tour and make records and you'll basically be an employee of Atlantic records for as long as the, as things work out. And, um, you know, we had the, the vibe at the time was like indie, indie, good, major, bad. Right. So a major record company, it was almost like selling out. That was the, that was the pinnacle of selling out was going to a major label. Even Cobain talked about it a lot. Um, so eventually the record company saw that doing it their way was not, selling record was not productive anymore and that if bands wanted to they could do it themselves just as well and make more money or be just as successful without a major record label so major record labels really had to step up their promoting and just supporting bands that they signed as opposed to just seeing which ones had a hit right off the bat and then dropping the rest right or putting all their money into one or two artists like bruce springsteen or madonna and and forgetting about the other bands that are there letting them flop so that shift had happened and we were really trying to decide, do we want to go with the major? Cause we would have had a lot of opportunities at that point. Cause our records were, 
well received critically, you know, all over the world. And it was, I, it was probably a matter of time before you would have heard the gets on, you know, the radio everywhere. Yeah. Funny story with Mia. Didn't she call her dad or something? She's like, I don't know. They're, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're willing to pay for my meal. Should I? She didn't think I it was, yeah. She, she ordered lunch at a, when we got taken out to lunch by this record company and she was afraid she didn't have enough money to pay for it. So she called her dad to try to get him to send her money. Like, <laughs> off his credit card in the moment. And like, no, I think they're going to pay for it. That was his yeah. Point. His response was great. He's like, don't worry. They're going to take care of it. Yeah. You guys played on bills with Beck, Nirvana, mud, honey, Joan Jett, bikini kill L seven, among others. There's a great story in the book about he played. It was Nirvana, the gets Tad and crunch bird, a band I yeah. never heard of. I didn't, yeah, yeah. yeah. You banned for life from the University of Washington <laughs> campus. Do you remember why? That, yeah, what happened? I think we just destroyed the the dressing room, which was the classroom. We didn't know. You know, I, um, it was actually. Oh, I'm going to throw Nirvana under the bus because they were the ones that were destroying <laughs> everything. We were just sitting there. The, 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 yeah, the yeah, eraser yeah. fight wasn't it? Kurt throwing a, an eraser at uh, uh, Kurt and Chris <laughs> throwing, chasing each other around the room and throwing like. One time he took a whole bus tub and like full of ice and soda cans and just like chucked it at, at, um, at Kurt who ducked and missed it. And like, I think it like hit us partially, but it was just like, they were just showing off and being silly. Where, what year would this be? Would, had they already come out with? Uh... That would have been 1990. Oh, 90. Okay. 14 yeah. spirit, I think. Got it. Yeah. He was sitting next to me, I think. And he was chatting with her saying, you guys are good. Yeah, we were chatting for a bit. Yeah, and they got to know them a little bit, and then later on, after Mia died, they actually stepped up and volunteered and did a, a benefit uh, show, which has just been really. It's just on YouTube now for the first time, and I remember it. It was an amazing little show that they. Kurt called me at home and said, "You know, we'll, you know, we heard what happened. We're really sorry, and could we, you know, do anything to help, like play? Because I had organized another show, and uh, with some other bands, smaller bands, and they asked if they could jump on that bill." And I was like, oh, sure, if you want to, you know, if you're on time. No, I didn't say that. But um, uh, I was like, sure. And Courtney got on the line at the same time. I was like, who are, are you going to start making some demands about who, you know, what how the show should go and what time they should go on and when we could announce it to press. So I just was like, sure, whatever. And they showed up and and set up and just played like it was a regular. They were a regular band playing a regular little show. And but they kicked ass. They were really good. And at that point, I was like, man, everything I, uh, you know, I, I was just, uh, I was a fan and devotee at that point. Yeah, Kurt was a cool, cool dude, huh? Down yeah, to earth. He, he, he's a really quiet guy. You know, he's really quiet and private. And uh, I think he, you know, he could be a lot of different people. He could be, he could be a, a sweet guy. He could also not be <laughs> depending on who you were and his state of mind and depression does a lot of things to people. And I think it didn't always have the best effect on Kurt. What about Mia's lyrics? Where did she get inspiration from? You say she kept journals. So did she look for inspiration or did just, did it just come to her? She just she had inspiration from her friends going through stuff around her, things that she went through, things that she had overcome, but it wasn't like poor pitiful me lyrics. The, the lyrics would, her lyrics would talk about a situation abstractly and then the bridge of the the song might might be uh some solution and then the the final verse might be how it was res- the total result re- resolution of the problem so she would write st- stories and like small like little stories and chunks that that you could kind of apply to stuff you're going through in your own life and she had a way with doing that like making it universal that way yeah, she had a unique voice and a style, just the way that she would, the, the phrasing over the beat, and just an emotionally yeah. raw, you know, just kind of singing from deep down. It seemed easy for her. It was amazing. Yeah. But she would actually work for weeks on on the words and um, and the phrasing. And she'd take a little re- cassette recorder and record a song that we would play instrumentally and just listen to it over and over and over again, and like write lyrics, write lyrics, tear them up, write them over, start over. And she would pull from her journals bits and... um because she was writing all the time um and she would pull songs out of her journal entries or use the words from her journal to tell the story that she wanted to tell so the songwriting process would she come with lyrics you guys would try to write something around the lyrics or we would usually write song usually sometimes we'd write the songs 
without her there. Sometimes she'd be there and just sort of listen while we played and come up with a few words or that would change and, and morph into something else. But it, it depended on just sort of the mood. Uh, oftentimes Andy, sometimes Andy would work with Mia privately and they would do lyrics and he, and play guitar together for hours and come up with something and then bring it to the band. Sometimes the whole band would jam for a while and then Mia would hear it, record it, take it back to a room, listen to it and work on it for a long time and then finally bring lyrics back. Sometimes she'd have a finished song just, just like that. Sometimes it would take over practicing over and over and over again. Depends. You could get into, like anyone, I, I got into a writer's sl slump, right, writer's block. What do you call it? Writer's block? Yeah, yeah. writer's block. <laughs> for several months, you know, I just couldn't write anything. And then, or sometimes it would take me a month and I would write one sentence. And that would be, I, I would write one, a whole chapter, but only one sentence would be good. So the rest I'd have to throw away. And sometimes I'd sit down in five minutes and write two chapters and it would be good. You know, so it was like, you can never tell. It's just like when the muse speaks, you have to listen. And yeah. Then, hope that you have a pen as a writer i know it's just it, it sucks you're just staring <laughs> yeah. at the page staring at a blank it's really lonely you know it can be really <laughs> lonely to be just sort of yeah. pulled up like looking at a screen or a piece of paper for hours and not producing anything and like, yeah how about the the gets most important song second skin is someone wrote it's the most important song and it was written in 30 minutes during so, a rehearsal but you say not true i don't know i think yeah i mean it seemed like it because we got shut down by the cops because we were too loud. Yeah. That's Raj. And uh, we got shut down. So I think, I think we knew the cops had been there or someone had called. And I think we had a certain amount of time that we had, this could be wrong, but the way I can think of it now is like, we only had so much time to, to practice, you know, cause we didn't have a space. So we're practicing in mass garage and the cops are on their way. So we have to finish it up quickly. And for some reason it got put out that way, but I, actually, I mean, that was just kind of we were at the peak of our powers pretty much when we wrote that song. And it was just, we were all in a good mood. It was just flowing. And it, it, it was definitely written, put together in one afternoon, at least, you know. And what is Mia singing about? I have no idea. No, it was, yeah. um, um, it was a song about, essentially about overcoming adversity and resilience, in essence. And um, I've had more a lot of people who who've come up to me privately and said that that song had meant something you know had been the song that changed or saved their lives or kept them yes up. you talk about that in the book yeah. right yeah, yeah that, that was that was when you went to the the screening of the documentary and a few people came up to you yeah we were working on a documentary we had about a 30 minute long black and white documentary and we screened it at I mean, the music museum in seattle um it's called the pop museum i think or something but um yeah, someone stood up and during the Q and A and said that that song had saved their lives and um, they were going to commit suicide and that they had that song was queued up and they it came up when they were just about to do it and they listened to it for a second and then they decided not to. So just in that really direct way, it's like an example of how her songs uh, meant a lot to people that didn't know her, you know, which is a powerful thing. Yeah, what a story. Made it worth writing. Made it worth that alone wasn't the only reason but that certainly made me feel like what i was doing needed to be done that that she needed to be recognized as as um as the great that she was yeah and i want to ask about the dream that you had too because this oh. was on the the morning that you heard the news this is july 7th of 93 yeah. and you you had awoken from a dream and she was in that dream yeah it was a dream i had it was um I was after um, we had. I was actually ten years after she had been killed, and this was. Um, I was at home. I pretty much had been trying to keep the investigation going, even though it'd been so long. We needed to raise money because we had a private investigator hired that we needed to pay, and we had run out of money at that point. And I woke up one morning and I was feeling happy, and I decided to burn some CDs and send them to my friends because records were out of print and i thought gosh this music's still good you know people should hear it and i was burning the cds when the that dream i i remembered my dream had been that um um 
we had met at a park on a park bench somewhere and she had said not to worry that she was fine that she was playing jazz music singing jazz in like underground clubs in new york or something and i was like oh that's great nice to see you and we said goodbye she said not to worry it was a very vivid dream and i hadn't dreamt about her much at all so she she appeared in my dream and then that day the phone rang uh that very afternoon and someone said oh, you don't know me but i work for the miami herald and i have on good authority that they have someone in custody who killed your friend. And I'm like, who is this? You know, this can't be true. And it was true. And she sent proof. And then the phone started to ring and the press was calling. And they extradited this guy from Miami, from the Florida Keys, actually, as far away from Seattle as he could get, and brought him back. And um, <laughs> the weird thing was, is that I was doing my internship for graduate school at the public defender's office, who was going to defend him. I was working there. Wow. I had a pass to go into the jail to see people. And um, that really sent me spinning about what, you know, what I could, what I could do, you know, what I, how I could approach this, what I would say to this person or what I would, could do to this person. Um, and that was uh, difficult to say the least. Um, so that was, that was tough. I just went straight over to Andy's house and we, we waited until we, we had proof. And then we, we were just sort of in disbelief. And I thought, Maybe this will make things change things for the better. Everything will be better. And uh, it 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 changed things, but it made things really rough for a while, too. Just uh, the acceptance of like, it, well, there was a trial and there was the whole idea that he might not be convicted. He'd be oh, yeah. Trial. Yeah. Because he was convicted on the smallest amount of DNA evidence ever used to convict someone. The, the evidence was so was. OJ had gotten off on buckets of DNA blood, right? Blood DNA from blood, buckets of it. This sample was so small that it had never been used in court before, and um, it was from it was from saliva from someone's teeth that they took the DNA that convicted him. Yeah, it was a was recent development one. too. A DNA. It was a development that DNA, had just... it cost a lot of money to to um, analyze DNA, and they thought they had pretty much no evidence from the scene of the crime. But in that case, uh, the M medical examiner had saved this DNA 10 years prior to DNA ever even being, before the genome was was um, analyzed, like the human genome. Um, and it was, so he had the foresight to save this DNA evidence that had never been used in court before, 10 years prior to it being used in court. And then it was like right in that, and during that year, that DNA was, was, um, uh, was able to be analyzed in such a small amount to to make a match with somebody, and they did. Hmm. Well, so but was, I, I I don't think that dream was a coincidence. Uh, you think about yeah, that I stuff. Mean, really think about that. I mean, there was a lot of. I can go into my my theories on it, but yeah, but I want to yeah sound crazy. Yeah, yeah. The uh, you know, like my dad passed a few years ago, and there are things that have happened, like the two year anniversary of his passing, you know, a few things. I was like, mm, I don't think that's a coincidence. You know, you just, yeah, you, you could try to ignore those things, but if they keep happening, you're like, yeah, maybe there is something to it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't explain it. Some things can't be. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just tried to explain the book. I tried to explain what was so good about me as, as a singer and as an artist and as a performer, what, what, why she was such a, an amazing friend to the people that knew her and basically what what the world lost when she died and that 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 was the main flux of the book well fortunately uh, spotify has the music on there i'm sure you know so it's yeah. there people can go it's and there. listen youtube it's there so that's that's the good thing it's not like you have to search hard no it wasn't so long ago <laughs> it wasn't so long ago that you would have to go to a brick and mortar store and find a used record and take it home and get a return table and listen to it, you know, it wasn't that long ago. And, um, but that really kept, it kept us going. I think after Mia was killed, uh, cycle, just personally, I think it having the music and trying to get the music out there and re-releasing the records was kind of a part of the mission that kept us, gave us something to think about and do that was positive it was pro music. It was pro life, if you will, and like uh, we wanted to um, keep the name alive. I did anyway. Well, there are four altogether now. People can get. There's the first two studio albums. Kings and Queens would have been first music recorded before the first. 
Uh -huh. We did it in a studio, yeah. but it was considered a demo when it came out as a 17 song. I, I thought it was a complete album. I think it was a great album. It works together. It's just recorded live to two tracks. And then the two other studio records came out in 92 and 90 or 93 and 94 posthumously. The second one, the third and one. Sea Fish Louisville. That's that was a compilation of B sides and singles okay. and a couple and live stuff with okay. maybe one or two unreleased songs. But the um, the records are getting re released on Sub Pop Records um, very soon. That's good. You got yes. a favorite favorite song, favorite moment, musical moment uh, from Mia? I have different songs that I enjoy, but I think the first song on the first record, on on our second record, actually, um, Frenching the Bully, the first song on there is my favorite. It's called Absinthe and uh, just has so many twists and turns. And it's a, complete with a drum solo, a bass solo. It's kind of like three minutes of insanity that, that I think exemplifies everything we were capable of musically. Yeah. First song on this on the first side. Yeah. Was it hard? How long did it take for you to get to, cause there's that, what if there's, you know, we were so close. What did, to come maybe. to terms with that? What do you mean? I, well, you know, like if, if she was still with us, you know, what, what could have been, it's, it's hard yeah, not to think yeah, about that. Yeah. Right. On NPR <laughs> Wednesday. Like, yeah. where would it be now? Um, and I, I think we'd be still playing. You know, I think we probably had made a, quite a few records. And I, I saw the band X the other month at um, playing. They do like an annual uh, Christmas show or a couple of shows around Christmas time in the Bay Area. And they were so good, you know, and they just showed up in whatever they were wearing that day and just threw down and played their set. And I was dancing. I had a great time. And I thought about it, gosh, you know, and they were there. They're 10, 15 years older than we are. And I thought, damn, man, that could be us. That could be us doing like a, an annual Christmas show when we when we're low on money at the end of the year. You know, we could be doing this and and having you know it be packed at a two thousand four thousand seat venue for the rest of our lives, man. And I, I, I admire and and I envy bands that can do that. That can get together still and play. You know, even if they they haven't been functional. You know, a touring band for years and years. I always love to see bands that. I love, you know, get together years later. And oftentimes yeah. they're better musicians and, you know, from playing for so many years. I want to ask you about the letters that Mia wrote to you and mm -hmm. you put them in the book. And, yeah. it, and I love it because it's an old school typewriter she used. She, right? she wrote yeah. lyrics, letters from, to people on, on an old school <laughs> typewriter. Yeah, this goes back to 89. Like, yeah. Man, typewriter. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to read very quickly read the first letter begins with, quote, Dear Steve, I very much did get your letter. And on a day I needed it very badly, I told myself I needed to get some heartful soul from someone personal to me today. I was trying to seek my own strength, but I wanted to hear someone not just talking at me, but telling me they're on my side. Could you share what, a little bit of what's behind that letter and, and why you uh, included that and the, the other letter in the book? I love when it. When we were in college, we were, that was hard. It was a hard decision to put that in or not. But I decided to do it because it just showed the the closeness of our friendship as opposed to like us being lovers or something, which we weren't. So it was, um, and just how she, how, how personable she was and where her mind was at and how she communicated. Um, that's why I think we, a lot of times we were started the band and then we were at a college that you'd spend six months on campus a year and then six months off campus. So the only way we had of communicating back in the day, <laughs> in those days, was through letters and phone calls, which were very expensive to call long distance, you know? So we wrote, we wrote letters back and forth and I love to write and she liked to write. So we would write letters back and forth. I would write with the other guys as well. Um, but she would, she would be spending time doing an internship or a co-op, they called it away from the campus and I might be on campus. And so we'd write back and forth. Remember she, yeah, the, it, um, one year I, I worked in Florida I went to Florida and worked as a social worker for six months as one of my internships. And she was back in Ohio. And so we wrote, I think, I think that letter was written. I don't know. Maybe I was in Europe. I think I was in Europe at the time studying in Europe and she was back in the States somewhere. And so we would write back and forth the campus, the campus of Antioch being like the, the hub for our PO boxes and letters that we were traveling to pick up stuff there. So, yeah, we were apart a lot of times. The first three years of the band, we were probably only together in the same town for a year and a half of it or a year. 
total. Yeah, I think it's, I'm glad you put those letters in. It just shows it's a personal touch to it. And it just shows the side of her that, you know, that uh, nobody knows. It, and, it, you know, it's, it's, you can tell, you, what, did you, it looks a little, a little beat, you know, it's got the fold marks in it. And you, you <laughs> yeah, that's just out of my pocket, I think. Seven twenty two eighty nine, July 22nd of 89. And then the other one is uh, January 23rd of 89. Once she gave me, um, right upon when I was graduating as a graduation present, sort of just a letter, she rushed into town and handed that to me and then took off again. I don't know. Yeah, remember exactly what happened. And then six months later, we'd meet in Seattle and start going as a band. Well, it's the the book. It took many years. It's It's out. And what's cool about a book, somebody could discover the band a year from now, a day from now, 10 years yeah. from now. You know, these books are out there. They never go away. Hopefully they'll be in a library too. Yeah. So uh, people should go out and get it. It is, it's out uh, depending on when you're listening to this, August 13. So it's, uh, it's tomorrow uh, as far as when we're recording. Uh, Mia Zapata and the Gits, a story of art, rock and revolution out through Feral Books. And can people find you online if they want to reach out to you? Yeah. Uh, there's, um, boy, I haven't set up my social media, but there's a, a website. It's just stevemoriarty.org. They could reach me at stevemoriarty.org. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, now, and, and musically, what are you up to? Do you, do you still write, record I music? Now than ever, actually. And cool. um, I'm playing two or three bands. I play in a, in a cumbia band, which is a kind of a form of, it's a, a Colombian dance music, strangely. So it's like a Latin, Latin rock, psychedelic rock sort of thing. The band's called Malagreña, which means really bad hair. And then I play, <laughs> I play in a duet, like a, I play synthesizer and drums in a, in a sort of a fusion duet, kind of a noise fusion rock duet called TV 1984. And um, I should send you some music to include. Oh. I would love to, yeah. TV1984, what a cool name. <laughs> Thanks. I love that name. Yeah, I love it. it's just TV1980. I don't know why, but it, 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 it was a good year for TV, I guess. So, and then what is the third band, right? You said three bands here? Three bands. Oh, I was in a band called Shotwell, which is like a sort of a um, a punk, kind of a punk, political-oriented punk band out of San Francisco. They've been around since 93 or so. I toured with them in, in the 90s, and they asked me to come back and do it. So I came back and produced a record of theirs. I've been producing albums, too, and I produced a band called Cosmic Kitten, which is a, a, a Los Angeles band, young band, and um, uh, produce various records for people and help people with uh, drum tracks and recording and stuff too. That's so awesome. They yeah. still play every weekend, every rehearse all the time. And yeah. Cool. I'm happy to hear that, man. It was great to talk to you and, and congratulations on the book. And people should go out and get the book and people should go out and listen to the music of the Gits. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I really appreciate it. That's it. It's in the books.